and welcome to this Exploring Space Innovation and Leadership presentation with Sarah Murray. I'm really thrilled to be here today. Sarah and I have built up a relationship over a few months after she kindly um, appeared in our um, International Education and Schools webinar back in the autumn. And to say there are two more ex um, opposite characters, I don't think there possibly could be. But that's the whole point of today. It's International Women's Day and it's really important for everyone to reach their potential and to encourage more girls and women to get into STEM subjects and exciting areas like space. So we're absolutely thrilled to have Sarah joining us again. She's a truly um, inspirational trailblazer with a career over 20 years, which has obviously included NASA as a leader and her army career at the beginning, she'll tell you all about that. And now today she is the operation, head of operations for ISET, and she'll no doubt give you more information on that too. So please join us on this exciting journey as we push forward how to embrace equity um, around the world and really all reach our potential. So Sarah, over to you. ALS. Go for ALS. And we are go for ALS. The Space Launch System is now counting down to lift off of Orion on its maiden voyage to the moon. Testing the ability to steer the rocket into space. Launch team can no longer recycle the count. Sound suppression water now flowing okay. under the ML. And here we go. Hydrogen to burn off igniters initiate. Seven, six. Four stage engine start. Three, two, one. in returning our country to the moon and on to Mars. Hey, what an awesome launch. What an awesome launch. Welcome everyone to International Women's Day. I am Sarah Murray and I am here to share some of my experiences with you. Hopefully you will get something from it. I don't want to just share my experiences. I want to share my challenges and obstacles that I face. But first of all, I want to talk about that launch. So this was the Artemis 1 mission, which launched November 1st, 2022. So just a few months ago, it is NASA's newest vehicle. And the ultimate goal is to take, to reestablish, actually, we want to reestablish human presence on the moon and beyond. I was so thrilled to be a part of this awesome, awesome program. 
But I will tell you that if someone had seen a young girl, I would say a young toddler and uh, this cute young toddler, I don't think that they would have known that this young toddler would be a key contributor to NASA's human program to space. So before I talk to you about my career, I really want to talk to you about the background and the foundation from that this young toddler got from their family. So my parents migrated from Mississippi and uh, along with uh, millions of other Blacks because the South of the United States, I mean, the there were atrocities that were going on and they really felt that there were more opportunities if they went north. So they migrated from Mississippi. I was born in Detroit, Michigan. I was raised in St. Louis. My parents gave me a foundation that I stand on today. One of the things that I will always remember my mom telling me is that whatever you do, make sure that you are the best at it. If you are a janitor and you're mopping the floor, no janitor better mop that floor better than you do. And I stand on that. I watched my dad work three jobs. He worked full-time at Pepsi-Cola Bottling Company. He had his own taxi and he had his own cleaning business. And he had five young employees, his children, that helped him clean offices on the weekend. So I know that they taught me quite a bit. I can't talk about my background without talking about these bonehead brothers. Hopefully they're not tied in because I always call them my bonehead brothers. I had four brothers. And the point that I want to make here is that though we grew up in a, a pretty bad neighborhood, we did not let that environment define us. And for example, the young man with his hand on his chin there, he recently retired from the military. He was a lieutenant colonel in the army and the young man next to him kneeling, he is fluent, completely fluent in Spanish and in Farsi. And if, if some of you don't know what Farsi is, it is the language that's spoken in Iran. So my point is we did not let that environment define where we were headed. So. I grew up in St. Louis. I completed, I did well in high school. And then I applied to Arizona State University. So Arizona State University was quite a ways from St. Louis. However, my parents drove for two days, over a thousand miles through the desert. There were eight of us in the car to take me to Arizona State. Now, when we got there, they had no record of my applying, no record. Can you imagine going through that long drive, my parents spending the very little money that they had to get me there, and they did not have any record of me. We were just devastated. However, the school worked with us, they finally got me registered. They found some loans and grants that I could use and then also found a job as a teacher's assistant because I already had calculus in high school and I love math. And so I was able to make some money. So I am on the path to being a doctor. That was my goal. However, that is not what happened. That doctor plan fell through slightly. It did not happen, but instead of coming home with a diploma from Arizona State, I came home with this person here, a marriage license. And I know I, know I don't have to tell you guys that my parents were not happy because they had gone through a lot to get me through school, to school. And here I dropped out and I got married. And this was a huge detour from my path of being a doctor. Instead of finishing school, I joined the military, joined the United States Army, 
But let me tell you, detours are okay. It's okay to have a plan, but you really need to be flexible because plans can change. This was a, a larger detour than I expected, but I absolutely learned from being in the military. I also learned something. I didn't know what it was called at the time, but now they call it emotional intelligence. And without knowing it, I had emotional intelligence. And, and for those of you who don't know what that is, what it really is, is understanding and processing, being able to understand and process your feelings, being able to express your feelings, also being able to engage with others' feelings. So when I got into basic training, if you're familiar with basic training, that's when the soldiers are first inducted into the military and they have these drill sergeants and they're yelling and screaming at you. And they're really trying to stress you out to see if this is the world for you. I knew that that was their job. It didn't bother me whatsoever. And so with my emotional intelligence, I understood what was going on and I made it through. Now, my entire time spent in the military, most of that was spent in Germany. I worked in Grafenbeer, Germany in uh, the emergency room there, learned quite a bit in the emergency room. That was a really stressful job though. And I will say it was my first taste of crisis management. Think, think this, let's think about this. I was 20 years old and I was a supervisor in the emergency room. Talk about managing crises. I saw crushed skulls. I saw sucking chest wounds. I saw amputations. And my very first ambulance run was to go behind a nightclub where someone had hung a young black man. That was my very first emergency run. And so being in this environment, I really, I really relied on my foundation. And also the important thing about crisis management is to remain calm because that sets the tone for the rest of the team. And so I learned to remain calm no matter what, working in this emergency room. Learn quite a bit. I would say I'm glad that I learned it, but I would also say that my kids, I had four, were not so happy about what I learned because I was not quick to take them to the doctor. I was not quick to take them to the emergency room. And even to this date, I learned about injuries that they had that they never told me. I asked them, you never told me that. Why didn't you tell me about that? He says, mom, we know you're never gonna take us to the hospital. You just say you'll be all right. And then I can just smile and look at them and say, and you're all right, right? So they may not have been so happy about it, but I learned a lot from it. And I wish I had time to brag about them, but I don't. But just very, very quickly, I had four, I had four children. One is great with writing lyrics for songs. I have another one, they're very different. The other one trains dogs to herd cattle. He trains dogs to hunt wild boar. My daughter has joined the Peace Corps and she is serving a two year stint in Madagascar. And my oldest son, who was actually born in Germany, we lost him about two years ago in a motorcycle accident when he was about 40 years old. He served in the Air Force and served his time in Afghanistan. So I would love to brag about them, but right now I wanna make sure that you get something out of what I want to share with you about my career. So after the military, I went back to school. And instead of going, for that doctor, I had a family and I really didn't have the time, nor did I have the money to uh, go through medical school. So I selected electrical engineering. And when I say this says this was tough, not I am not talking about academically tough. I'm talking about everything else that I had to navigate through. And this photo here, this was exactly me in school. I had a, I did not have a car. I had a bicycle, 
well, not exactly. We weren't wearing masks during that time, but I had a bicycle and I had a toddler and that is exactly how we got around. Also, appreciate the laptops because they did not exist when I went to school. And if they did, I could not afford them. I spent a lot of time in the computer labs with my toddler and a sleeping bag under the computer. I will also say that this was the first time that I experienced blatant discrimination and racism. I was studying with a classmate. We were studying old exams and he noticed that my answers were the same as his answers. However, he had an A, a 90 something, and I had a 70 something. We just assumed that the professor made a mistake. He says, Sarah, take my exam and you can go show it to him so that they can fix your grade. Well, I was not ready for the response. When I asked him about my exam and said that perhaps you made a mistake, the very first words that came out of his mouth were, women don't belong in engineering. I was flabbergasted. I honestly didn't know what to say. After having a discussion with him for a few more minutes, it was obvious he was not gonna change my grade. I did try complaining to the, the engineering department. Nothing was done and I had to suck it up. But I will tell you, I did not let that deter me. I did not. And so I successfully graduated receiving a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering. And now I am ready to go to work. So, all right, so I love this image because it, it's, it's not complete, but it's sending a message. And I think you know what that message is. Women have more obstacles than men. Not that men don't have obstacles, don't get me wrong, but the message is they have more. And I think if you guys take a look at this, you can probably see that there are probably some obstacles missing from this also. So just kind of think about all the things that you have to do, you women out there, all the things that you have to do in your daily lives. And I know that you will see that there are some things missing. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. So besides doing the laundry and doing the dishes and, and everything else that you have to do, there is or was, and maybe in some cases still there still are, general biases against females, especially in the STEM arena. Also, some women are still fighting for equal pay, even though they're doing the same job. And then also there were biases against pregnant women or, or sometimes they wouldn't hire women because, oh, they might get pregnant. And I will tell you a, an example. I got a phone call one time from a network director. And when I say network, I'm talking about the communications network that the space program used. It's a saddle. It's a network of satellites around the earth and then also antennas on the ground. So he was the director of this network and he offered me a job being a network manager and I accepted it right away, right away. I hung up the phone and I thought to myself, does he know I'm pregnant? And during this time, I thought, surely he, he doesn't mean to hire me and I'm pregnant and I'm about to go on maternity leave. So what silly me, what did I do? I picked up the phone and I called him back and I asked him, I says, you do know I'm pregnant, don't you? And he said, yes, Sarah, I know. So I was very fortunate to have men as allies in my path. Very fortunate. I know everyone's not that fortunate, but I was fortunate. And I, I took that job and did very well at it. So what we're going to do now is talk about the career that I had at NASA. Now, I have held a number of positions in my 30 years of uh, at NASA. I'm not going to go over them all, but the ones that are highlighted here, they're bolded. I want to specifically talk to those because I think they will bring out some of the points and messages that I want you to take away. 
from this talk. So the very first job that I got right out of school was a flight controller for the space shuttle, a flight controller. That meant that I was controlling the space shuttle. Sarah Murray was controlling a space shuttle. We were sending commands to the space shuttle. And if you bring up the next slide here, you will see that uh, what we did, we would take, we took group pictures of our teams. And I'm gonna give you like two seconds to take a look at this and tell, and, and I wish we could, this, this would be great to have a conversation, but I know that you see what stands out here. I know it's very, besides me, I, 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 I'm right there in the front, but there's some other things that should be standing out. First of all, there is a lack of diversity. Total, there's a lack of diversity in the clothing. There's a lack of diversity in the gender and a lack of diversity in the race and ethnicities. And so this was the environment that I had to navigate. When I first went to NASA and I was, they were doing an orientation for me, walking, walking me around the building, showing me where the supplies were. Two gentlemen walked by me. And as they walked by me, they said, it's starting to look like the ghetto around here. And so NASA is a very different NASA now. They have embraced diversity, but I had to be determined and I was very determined to be successful. And let's just talk about determination and perseverance. So I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the movie called Hidden Figures, but um, it is a movie about these real life women who were actually the computers that did the calculations for the space program. And the, the photo on the left here is a photo of the actresses that played their roles. And the photo on the right are the actual women. And they did quite a bit to overcome uh, all the discrimination that they had to face. But I have a quick video that I want to I want you to see. It is a clip from the movie. Please pay special attention because there are a number of messages in this video. Where the hell have you been? Everywhere I look, you're not where I need you to be. It's not my imagination. Now, where the hell do you go every day? Izzy, I don't know if you can turn it up or everyone turn it up on their laptops. It's low for me. For 40 minutes a day? What are you doing there? We're T minus zero here. I put a lot of faith in you. There's no bathroom for me here. What do you mean there's no bathroom for you there here? There is no bathroom. There are no colored bathrooms in this building or any building outside the West Campus, which is half a mile away. Did you know that? I have to walk to Timbuktu just to relieve myself. And I can't use one of the handy bikes. Picture that, Mr. Harrison. My uniform, skirt below my knees, my heels, and a simple string of pearls. Well, I don't own pearls. Lord knows you don't pay colors enough to afford pearls. And I work like a dog, day and night, living off a of coffee from a pot none of you want to touch. So, excuse me if I have to go to the restroom a few times a day.
there you have it. No more colored restrooms. No more white restrooms. Just plain old toilets. Go wherever you damn well please. Preferably closer to your desk. Here at NASA, we all pee the same color. Okay, what a powerful, powerful scene. And if you have not seen Hidden Figures, I would like to give you some homework. Please find some time to take a look at it because there are some scenes there that are just as powerful as this one. And what I want you to take away from this are, are two things. First of all, Kevin Costner's character was an ally. He is an ally. And, and we can't make changes by ourselves. If you are in a position to make changes, to help become an ally, especially the men, if you're in that position to do that, do so. And what he also said here at NASA, we all pee the same color. Okay, so I, I love that. If you have time to look at the video at that movie, please do so. And it's great for, for the kids to see also. So the next few positions that I talk about are going to be my leadership positions. And this photo here is a photo of the group of folks that I first led. And this is the Space Shuttle Communications Group. And as you can see, it looks a lot different from that previous photo that I showed you with all the white males and all the white shirts. There is more diversity. Also, the difference in time, this, this picture was taken about 10 years after the other picture. So, so very different. And as I said, NASA has embraced diversity, which is great. Now, my challenge here was leading a highly, highly intelligent group of folks. And that requires self-confidence in myself because a lot of these folks knew more than I did. They had been there longer than I did. As a matter of fact, when I was selected for that position, I had to compete for that position. I had been with this group this time for about two years. And I was competing against a gentleman that had been there for 13 years. He was clearly more knowledgeable about the communication, shuttle communication system than I was. But why do you think I got the position? Because he could not work as a team. Because he was so intelligent, because he had so much knowledge, he made lots of decisions without including the rest of the team. It is so very important to include the rest of the team. And so I was able to be selected for that position whether I had the knowledge or not, I knew how to get it. And I knew how to rely on my team and make sure that we all worked as a team. So that confidence though, don't get that confused with knowing everything. You don't have to know everything to be self-confident. Okay, so, so it's very important. No one wants to follow someone that does, doesn't have confidence in themselves. If you don't have confidence in yourself, why should your team have confidence in you? Okay, so, so from there, my next leadership position was during the Space Shuttle Columbia Recovery Act effort. So in 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia, uh, there was a devastating accident. We lost crew members. And um, this was a very different environment for, you, for me. I had never led in this type of crisis. And again, I learned quite a bit from that. Now, uh, one thing that I want to highlight, first of all, the photos that you're seeing here are prisoners that were helping us look for debris. And they were stationed in Nevada and Utah because the debris fell across the United States. When the space shuttle entered the atmosphere, the heat caused the towels to start coming off. And so they're right on the west coast of the United States over California. 
and it just broke up from California all the way to Louisiana where the heavier parts. So we went out to see these prisoners and thank them for helping us with uh, looking for the debris. The, the thing that I want to do here is how, how, how did I lead through this disaster? One of the things that happened was one of my team members came up to me and said that he wanted to have prayer. So we worked uh, in a government facility, government property. And so we try not to offend. And so um, practicing religion wasn't really encouraged because we didn't want to offend all the different religions that were around. So what I did was I went to my supervisor and said, I, we really want to have prayer. I will make sure everyone understands they are not required. They can join us if they want. And uh, I sent a note out and I'm so glad that I did that because everyone in my team showed up for prayer and it was something that they needed. So it's okay to take a chance and you have to be, and that's, that's emotional intelligence also. As a leader, it is so important to be able to understand the feelings of your team. And that's what I felt that I was doing. And so after the accident, my next position was with Space Station. And this was a really key moment for me because I learned, so, so first of all, this is, the position is deputy chief of the training organization. So the training organization was responsible for training astronauts, flight controllers, and the instructors. But because the space station is an international space station, the astronauts had to all train together with our international partners. And our international partners were Japan, Canada, Europe and Russia. And so my job was to chair the International Training Control Board. And this is where I discovered that I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy learning about different cultures and yet another different type of leadership, understanding the different nuances within the different cultures and how to get this team to jail. And, and we did a really good job at it. And I'll give you a couple of examples. One of them is innovation. So innovation is always, always important. And I want to make sure that I, I encourage you guys to encourage your folks to be innovative, especially the young folks. The young folks will come in with ideas, but they may not be comfortable bringing them up and communicating them. So it is your job as leaders, those of you that are leaders or in some type of leadership position to create what we call psychological safety. That means that people feel safe speaking up, whether it's something good, whether it's something bad, whether they have some ideas, maybe they haven't thought through, but it is so important to encourage psychological safety, especially with the young folks, because sometimes they may not feel psychologically safe, and uh, but they have great ideas and they learn some things also. So that was key for that team is that we had to be innovative because we had to listen to what everyone had to say. So now I want to move on to. The next position, this is the NBL, Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. This is where we train the astronauts for their EVAs, extravehicular activities, their spacewalks. And I actually have a video that will talk more to that. Let's take a look at that. So what you see here in the video, these are two cranes. The astronauts are on the cranes. They are in their spacesuits. Those spacesuits weigh about 300 pounds. And for those of you that don't live in the United States, it's about 127 kilograms. And we need those cranes to take them over and put them in the water. When they are immersed in the water, there are also mock-ups of the space station in the water. And they use those mock-ups to practice the task that they will be performing when they get into space. The MBL is the best environment to sim that simulates microgravity for an extended period of time. 
There are always safety divers in the water with these uh, astronauts as they practice their task. Now the NBL is, it's one of the largest indoor pools in the world. It is 62, it's about 62 meters long, 31 meters wide, 15 meters deep, and has 6.2 million gallons of water, or 23 and a half million liters of water. Um, you can talk to the astronauts through their suits, but you also have speakers. These folks here, they are always monitoring every move that is being made by the astronauts. But I just wanted to make sure that you saw that this was, again, another leadership job. I was responsible for this facility and I learned quite a bit from that also. So now, so I've talked to you about the NBL and uh, some of my jobs. One of the last jobs that I did was with NASA headquarters. NASA headquarters, that's in Washington, D.C. Another key moment, I learned that I am not very fond of politics. And it was NASA headquarters job to set priorities and goals for the NASA centers, but also to communicate and interact with Congress and with the president. And though it is needed, I prefer the technical aspect. So as I, as some people say, it was a nice place to visit, but I really wouldn't want to work there. So I did a stint there at NASA headquarters. The photo that you see here is Charlie Bolden. I met him in 1988 when he was an astronaut, an active astronaut. And then later during President Obama's administration, President Obama selected him, appointed him as a NASA administrator. So time went on and we were able to work together again. So I've talked to you about my careers. I want to move on now and talk a little bit about why I was able to continue going. What I will tell you is that you need to find what keeps you going. For me, it seemed people like the young ladies depicted in hidden figures. I know that they went through obstacles and if they can get through them, then I can get through them and you can get through them. This is a photo of some young ladies in India. It's in a city called Agra outside of, uh, it's near the Taj Mahal. These are all acid attack victims, acid attack victims. And they run a restaurant and the funds that they get by running that restaurant, they use to help other acid attack victims. And you know, we get up every morning and sometimes we complain about our hair, we complain about pimples on our face. And when I see what these ladies are doing for others, these are the things that tell me, Sarah, don't complain. If they can do it, you can do it. And I think you guys will agree with that. So, um, I want to also talk to you about STEM itself, STEM careers. I don't know, I wish I was out there with you. I'd like to see a show of hands. How many of you are already in STEM careers? How many of you are going to school to be in a STEM career? But why is this important? It is important because it provides diversity of thought. Women will a lot of times think differently than men. And when you have diversity in thought, then you have better solutions. Also, I think it's important for women to go into STEM careers because you set an example for other women who are interested. They see that it can be done. So that's another important reason that you wanna do that. And so I also want to tell you that there are so many different opportunities related to STEM out there. And this is a chart that just kind of just splats them all out there. There are probably, there are more than this out there, but there are quite a few. You just have to do your research, understand what your personality is, what you like, and go for it. And I will tell you also that when you do that, try to find a mentor or someone that can help you. I want to talk to you about a STEM program that I am associated with 
uh, through ISET, and it's called Mission Discovery. It is an amazing program. It's a five-day program where teenagers, usually around the ages between 14 and 18, they get an opportunity to work with NASA astronauts and NASA leaders like myself. They are taught leadership, teamwork, presentation skills, and this is all taught using space as a platform. The teams will come up with ideas for experiments which use microgravity. And the results of those experiments must be beneficial to the Earth, mankind, or future spaceflight. The winning experiment gets launched to the space station for the astronauts to conduct it. And so uh, I think a, a video is worth the, you know, picture's worth a thousand words. This video is worth, worth much more because it'll give you a great idea of what the students get out of it. Day five, the students are hyped. They're ready to communicate to the judges their design experiment. There will be two rounds of judging. Five finalists will be selected. And from those five finalists, the judges will select a winning experiment. That winning experiment will be launched to the International Space Station for the astronauts to conduct. How incredible is that? The winner of Mission Discovery at Teens College is Team Five! I don't think any of us thought we would actually win. I mean, we believed in our idea, of course, but there were so many amazing other groups. I'm sure we've never thought of ourselves as astronauts or people worthy of having an experiment carried out in space. So I think this experience has really taught us that you can do anything um, and with such brilliant people working alongside you I, I think it's so worth it to come onto this course because now we have this amazing experience and it's gonna be something we carry through with us for the rest of our lives. I learned that anyone can do anything with anyone with the right mindset. You are the future generation of science and we see some great discoveries coming out of this room in the future. Well done everybody, you're fantastic. Talent in itself is often overrated. This notion of what was said, you can do it if you've got the right mindset, I believe is true. Get over this fear of failure. Be asked to do something hard. Don't shy away. Work together as a team and accomplish something. The International Space School Education Trust has the goal of utilizing space and the human space program to inspire young people to make something of themselves. Generally speak it, to inculcate what I could, would call the NASA you can do it spirit. Having the mentors there and having uh, advisors going around working with the tables to ensure that the, the quietest voice will get heard. At the start of this week, I definitely wouldn't be standing up right here. Um, <laughs> Thanks to the amazing people here, they've given me a voice so I can speak to all you guys. I'm really thankful for that. The confidence of doing something really difficult as part of a team is an experience they can carry with them for the rest of their life, no matter what they end up doing. I, I, the young lady at the end of that video, I, re, I vividly remember her. She was so afraid to get up and talk. At the beginning of the week, she was very timid and she couldn't talk. And as you see, she was amazed at what she was able to do. And this is what these students experience in this program. So if you ever get an opportunity to either participate or you know some teenagers that would love to participate, please look up ISET and Mission Discovery. And in summary, I just want to say that I have talked to you about my accomplishments. I wanted to tell you one other thing. Sometimes we are so busy trying to be successful. For me, I didn't realize I was successful. I know it sounds weird, but I did not realize that I had accomplished what I accomplished. And one of my dear friends Julie Keeble that I met in uh, London at King's College said, well, Sarah, what else do you wanna do? And it forced me to look back at what I've done 
and uh, realized that I had accomplished quite a bit. So wherever you are today, whatever you're doing, take that as a notch in your belt because you had to do something to get there. And it doesn't mean that you stop there. You just keep going and you persevere. So, so I, I'm going to leave you also. Get yourself a mentor or a sponsor. And if you can mentor someone, mentor someone. And if you can watch Hidden Figures, please take a look at Hidden Figures. Okay, so I have taken you from that little toddler that you saw in the beginning to this old lady. <laughs> and uh, I hope you were able to see that anyone can do this. You need that determination. You need that perseverance. It's not going to always be easy, but it doesn't mean that you're not going to get there. You can get there. So thank you so much for your time. And um, we're going to open it up to questions. But also, if you have questions, I think there's a YouTube chat out there. You can put your questions in the YouTube chat. But we'd like to open it up to questions right now. And, and if you don't have questions, you have a comment, that's fine too, because I really want to make sure that you get something out of the time that you, I've spent with you. Brilliant. So thank you so much, Sarah. That was wonderful. <laughs> really was. And we started by me saying we didn't have much in common, but we do have a lot in, com in common because I think we both got emotional intelligence and we both um, have a real joy for doing the jobs we do and finding different ways and connecting. There are so many different things that you've brought out that will really resonate with our audience. There's yes, the global sure. mobility professionals um, who are uh, working cross-culturally and um, pushing forward diversity and inclusion. There's the risk management, which people have to contend with, um, and there's push pushing the barriers, um, and also this drive for STEM subjects um, mm -hmm. is absolutely fantastic, and our education um, group have already experienced that. So while these questions come in, um, can you tell us a bit more about um, the emotional intelligence you see nowadays? And has that changed um, with the roles there are about? I mean, what what are the exciting roles that are going to come in the future that young people don't even know exist? Or even, you know, the four or five generations in offices nowadays have no idea <laughs> what's coming down the line. Okay, so I'll, I'll address the emotional intelligence first. Do you ask, has it changed? I think it has changed. I think it still has a ways to go. Um, I know that sometimes women are seen as being emotional. Women and men can behave the same way. And a man will be, if, if he's firm, he will be seen as being very strong. And if the woman is firm, she could be seen as being stubborn. And so to me, that is a type of emotional intelligence, understanding where that woman is coming from. And just because she's behaving differently, she could be calm and still be firm, but I think it would be seen negatively. So I think we have some areas to grow there. Now, what was your other question about what's down the road? Is that what it was? Well, young, we've got some questions coming in, which I'll deal with the, okay. the, the pick up on that. But my second question to get people thinking as well outside the boxes is you're doing um, amazing experiments um, are being done at NASA and with ISAT sending these experiments. Yeah. But what sort of things are going on in the space sector that will impact jobs of the future and these roles that young people um, and women will be growing. So there's things like cyberspace and growing in um, uh, sorts of things. So, so, so quite a bit, actually, I would say quite a bit. Now, my expertise is in human space flight. So I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that. First of all, we know that we are going to Mars. 
And um, we NASA has started hiring geologists. That that is a, that is a, a, a career that we will need to go to Mars. Geologists and doctors, of course, doctors because you know they're going to be gone for a long period of time. So we need doctors aboard. Now, another good thing that's happening are the private industries that are in this space arena. You've got SpaceX and and Boeing and the other different companies. And so they obviously, they're going to need more people now. And I, I know more about SpaceX than the other companies. And I know that they have done an awesome job in hiring the young folks. And, and there is there are lots of opportunities in the other industries, not just at NASA, but within space in the private industries for the young folks down the road and even now. Brilliant. Thank you. So let's hope that stimulates some more specific questions. But back to your uh, points, uh, um, to the questions that have already come in. So please keep them coming in. Um, there's one here saying, I have three young daughters. What are the best things I can do to encourage them and expand their horizons? So, so one of the things that I wish I had done with my kids was expose them to science and technology early on. You know, little things like my, my, my grandson loves robots. He loves putting things together. I wish I had done more with that. You know, taking them out into nature, letting them explore the butterflies and how, you know, just expose them to those types of things and find out where their interests are. But, but the key is exposure because you won't know what they enjoy until they're exposed to it. So the more exposure, the more opportunity they have to find out what they really are good at. And I also tell folks that, that it is so important to get a job that you are good at. That may not happen in your first job or your second job. You just have to persevere. But when you work something that you are good at, you will exceed in it. Well, that's really timely because someone has written in, how can you keep going if you no longer know what you're passionate about? Ah, if you don't know what you're passionate about. Well, that's a good question because I think it's almost the same thing. You're going to have to try some things and figure out, you know, what strikes your fancy. Because I don't, I, I don't know the age of the person that's asking this. For the younger folks, I said it's exposure. If you're already working and you're not passionate about what you're doing, you need to get more exposure. You need to start doing some research and talking to folks that are doing different jobs that maybe you might be interested in. But it's it, it boils down to more research now and, and getting information on different jobs. Great. So there's a similar one here. How do you find your vision for what is next when you've accomplished a lot already in life? So, oh, my God. <laughs> so, no, I take uh, we've got all these different retire. generations. Yes, <laughs> retirement's a long way off. <laughs> so we need more people working productively and passionate. So how do you how do you find your way forward from that? So, so it sounds like this person has already accomplished quite a bit. And honestly, for me, my next step would be helping others with their accomplishments in those areas that you have excelled in, that you have accomplished, then help others to, to do those accomplishments. And also when you start interacting with different folks, you'll find out different things that they're doing and, and perhaps something might strike your, your fancy. But if you feel like you have accomplished quite a bit, then I would start with trying to help others uh, accomplish their goals. And that feeds back into your comments about mentorship as well and finding people to fight to a corner all the way up. Brilliant, thank you. So what else have we got to hear? Oh, here's a good one. You talk, we talked about your crisis situation, crisis management and the underwater work, et cetera. So here's someone saying, how do you keep calm and determined in face of so much adversity? Oh my gosh. 
the, it's an easy answer for me, but I don't think it's easy for everyone else. I, for me, I think it's my personality. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a calm person. If you are not a calm person, then you need to find a technique that will get you there. If it's breathing, if it's, you know, just taking a moment and walking away, there are different things that you can do that will help you remain calm. It's just like giving a presentation. I remember I hated giving presentations, but I knew that if I just smiled and someone smiled back at me, I was good to go. So, so you really need to find a technique that calms you. And that's gonna that's just gonna take some trial and error. But it's it is really very important to stay calm. And I know sometimes my husband gets so upset when he's just frantic about things. And my I think about what does getting frantic do for you, but make it worse, right? And so that's not, and, and then a lot of times you don't think clearly. So think about what the result of your not being calm. Well, if you're around your children and you're not calm, then you're teaching them how to respond. So think about how you would want them to learn to respond. But um, for me, I think it's mostly my personality. I, I, I really don't worry about things that I, I can't control. And I don't stress about things that, you know, it's water under the bridge. You just need to press on. So personality does play a lot into it. And if that, if you don't have that personality, then you need to find some techniques to help you out. Mm -hmm. And also, I suppose, um, it's sharing things with the team, building team relationships. Oh, that yeah. also came out hugely in, in what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So for people who are perhaps don't have that management experience, have you got a few tips about how do you build an international team? How do you build an international team? So I can tell you what I did. I, I, I focused on my relationship with my team members. I really did. And for example, when I first became chair of that International Training Control Board, we would meet face-to-face -face in some part of the world for a week to have a week-long meeting. And at the end of the week, we would have a social activity, something in the evening, you know, we've accomplished a lot, we'd have a social activity. What I did was I moved that social event to the beginning of the week instead of the end of the week so that it, people started warming up with each other. And then huh? I had lots of engagement during the rest of the week rather than having it at the end. I also... Empathy. Empathy is very important. Cultures, you really need to understand their cultures and they need to know that you care that they do things differently. And so there were many times where I, instead of having everyone in the room together, I would have a bilateral. I would, I would fly to Russia and just have a one-on-one -on -one with them and talk so that they understood that I'm really trying. I really want to understand. And a lot of times, even if they don't agree, they will understand why you make some of the decisions because you've built up this relationship with them, okay? And some of the other nuances, I, I did have a hard time with the Russians uh, acknowledging this woman, this black woman as the chair and the leader of this team. But that in that particular case, I just I was just very firm. I really was just very firm until they realized and we're not moving forward until you hear what I have to say and you answer my questions. But those those folks on my team, our international partners, we became we became great friends. I got Christmas cards when I visited their countries. They took us out touring. So so for me, it's a relationship. It doesn't have to be a close relationship, but I believe if they if you have the same goal. And they realize that you do care, then it makes that team more um, successful. Brilliant. Well, I think that's a very good way to close. You nicely joined everything together. And also, I would just point out, you obviously have a lot of fun along the way. So that's 
I do. I do have a lot of fun, especially after I found out that I love cultures. And so uh, the work that I do with ISET, with Mission Discovery, we've done that all over the world. We've done uh, those week-long programs in Singapore and Australia and India and in the UK, just all over. And so so I, I enjoy working with the teenagers and I enjoy being exposed to the different cultures. Thank you. Well, this is probably a, a great moment to do our equity embrace. Embrace equity on International Women's Day. Yes. So thank you very much, Sarah Money. Thank you. And I am honored to have been here. Thank you for the invite. And I hope everyone has taken something from this. Thank you so much. Thank well, you. it's been wonderful to speak to you today. So just to close, um, that I hope you'll uh, think it has been a really inspiring session with Sarah. And of course, you can listen back to it and pass the link on to your colleagues and friends. The link will be available shortly after we close. So once again, thank you for Sarah for joining us and for the ISET team for enabling this and for all schools and those in education who want to progress with the fantastic opportunities that ISET offers for young people, um, please do get in touch with us. And also just to say this is not the end of our International Women's Day celebrations. Um, as a project, um, we set to and started writing um, about um, global women that we'd come across across the global mobility sector and international managers and leaders. So you can read more inspiring stories on our website as a great resource and do share those to discover um, how it is that you can include greater diversity and equity in your organisation. And many people like Sarah had found a very different path to their career and were combining motherhood and um, other passions as well as their career. So do take a look at those. And then finally, this Friday on the 10th of March, um, at the Institute of Directors in London, we are holding a session inspiring global women for growth. And this is all about how to engage with our community and what we can do to move the dial for people working in an international context. So please do join us there. We have some fabulous speakers, including Caroline Thorley Farah of Worley, Jenny Hind of Clear Company and Sharmila Shah of Mastering Your Power author. And also we have Dr. Ami, Dr. Anino M. Muwo, who is going to be our keynote speaker. So please do join us and let's put down some fantastic goals and objectives to further the careers for women in international organisations and to support, support young people into STEM subjects. Thank you for joining us. Awesome.